Jean hit uh, the nail on the head here, which is that universal design is really about accessing accessibility. And universal design actually applies to uh, more than just education. Are, you, are we on? Yes, no? Okay, good, great. Uh, so we're on, great. Um, universal design, actually, the term comes to us uh, in the field of education from the field of architecture, actually. And it came about in the early 90s when the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, and which mandated that uh, buildings had to be barrier free so that people with disabilities would have access, equal access to the building as, uh, as people without disabilities have. So it was equal access. So what happened was that a bunch of uh, ramps went up. If you recall that time, uh, and you still see them around. You know, basically there's a lot of, uh, there were a lot of buildings that all of a sudden had ugly ramps built on them, which worked, but they were ugly. So architects began to take this on, and the, and the universal design move for architecture movement was born, uh, where architects said, why not take a different approach to building buildings? Instead of just building on all these ugly, stupid ramps. Uh, let's make a building that has barrier-free qualities that are, are good for people with uh, sensory, motor, sensory motor disabilities to get, to, uh, to get into buildings, but that, is, that are also good for everyone else, too. Because, actually, when you think about it, many of us have periods of time in our lives when we can't get around particularly well. You know, if you break your leg, and then of course there's aging, and people with walkers, and people in wheelchairs. Not necessarily a permanent condition, but, those, but when that happens, then we need elevators, uh, and we need, uh, and we need uh, easy access into a building. Uh, without having to climb stairs and so on and so forth. So in modern buildings, when buildings go up now, built oh, probably in the last 10 to 15 years, what you'll find is that they will have all these things that uh, make the building accessible to a diverse group of people, but that they will, but the building will be uh, attractive, and accessible to everybody and good for people who need elevators and ramps and, you know, and uh, braille on buttons and, and things like that. So, as education has become more student-centered and focused on the needs of increasing a, an increasingly diverse group of learners, educators began to think, we need to rethink our educational framework, our plan for env educational environments to, so that they will make learning accessible to the most diverse group of students possible. But that will have features that are good for those who have learning challenges, learning disabilities, who struggle, but are really good for everyone. So, as a result, universal design is actually, uh, what I'm gonna present to you tonight, is a theoretical framework based on learning theory that also has with it, and also in addition to that, a number of uh, best practices that have been researched, uh, that have been studied for what makes a good teacher and what learning, what practices in classrooms 
are most beneficial to the widest number of students. So that's really what we're talking about here. We'll talk about, you know, what the theory is based on. In fact, I will put my slide on here. Um, we'll look a little bit at differentiated cognitive processing, just a little bit. Um, because I can't seem to do anything, I can't seem to give any presentations without at least showing three pictures of the brain in the process. <laughs> and uh, then we'll look at universal design for learning and instruction theory. And then we'll look at evidence-based inclusive strategies. And I'll show you some examples. A lot of the examples that I'll show you uh, come from Landmark College where I used to, where I taught and worked for a number of years before moving back to Groves. But in fact, uh, hopefully you'll see that the, the kind of thing that you're seeing is applicable really to any, any grade level. So let's, uh, with that in mind, um, <clears throat> this is, I just love this quote. Learning can and often does take place without the benefit of teaching, and sometimes even in spite of it. But there is no such thing as effective teaching in the absence of learning. If kids are not learning, then teaching is not happening, despite what the teachers think. So this is, you know, this is what I, <clears throat> I like to try and get across to Teachers who become so obsessed with teaching their content that they tend to, you know, overlook what the, the students are actually learning, uh, actually learning going on. Um, so, the question is, what is learning and how does it happen? How do kids learn? And I'm, I'm soliciting ideas here. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. They learn by doing. They learn by trying. By, things they out learn and see by what doing. Works. Yep, they learn by experiencing. Communicating with others or teaching others. Communicating with others. Uh huh. Which can be mean talking or writing. Mm hmm. Expressive or language, either written or oral. How else do kids? Do, does learning occur? Through the senses. So, through yeah, seeing, through, through the senses, through, through seeing, through hearing, through um, touching, through moving. All these, all these things, you know, have to go on in order for um, students to learn. And actually, the more of this, the more senses we can involve in learning, the more effective and the more durable the learning actually is. And that's really true for everybody. So, what, uh, <clears throat> so we have to look at the brain here, of course, as I said. So what we have here is, um, if you look at the brain, and there are different lobes and areas, the left hemisphere of the brain is where language processing goes on, and that means reading, speech, uh, logic, uh, mathematical calculations a lot of the time. This is where, this is the analytic, uh, detail-oriented part of the brain. And when, when there are disruptions there, then there are difficulties with reading and speech and writing and math and things like that. The right hemisphere is is uh, the hemisphere devoted much more to visual and spatial concepts. So it's the right hemisphere of the brain that notices people's faces and can register, this person does not look happy with me, or this person looks annoyed, so I better stay away from that person, or that person looks totally happy. So when you have uh, disruptions in the right hemisphere of the brain, then there's disruption in how that person perceives 
the visual world around them.